Good morning. Welcome to Brunsfield Evangelical Church. My name is Archie. I'm the pastor in training here. Let me give you an especially warm welcome if you're new or you're visiting, if you're watching online, you're very uh, welcome with us this morning. Uh, We meet together as a church, as disciples of Jesus, Jesus who is the light of the world, uh, to encourage one another in our discipleship of him, to be disciple-making disciples. And so this morning, as we sing, as we pray to our God, as we hear from his word, this is our goal, to point one another to him and to glorify his name. And so uh, as we do that, I'm going to hand over to Gary and the band as we begin. Morning, everybody. Um, 
if you have had a week anything like mine, then you're probably going to benefit from taking a little bit of time just now just to um, create some space and focus on why it is that we're here and um, yeah, what we're here for. So let's just take a moment just to pause and to um, set aside the distractions that might be in our minds, not to completely close them out, but just to bring them before the Lord and um, have him as our focus this morning as we worship him. So let's just pause for a minute. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked advanced against me to devour me, it is my enemies and my foes who will stumble and fall. Though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. The war break out against me, even then I will be confident. One thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. For in the day of trouble, he will keep me safe in his dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of his sacred tent and set me high upon a rock. Then my head will be exalted above the enemies who surround me. And at his sacred tent, I will sacrifice with shouts of joy. I will sing and make music to the Lord. <coughs> Let's do that just now. Let's stand together. never failing let mercy fall on me everyone needs forgiveness the kindness of a savior the hope of nations savior he can move the mountains my God is mighty to save he is mighty to save forever author of salvation he rose and conquered the grave Jesus conquered the grave
My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation, he rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered. Yeah. 
in spirit and truth, pouring out the oil of love as my worship to you. In surrender, I must give my every part. Lord, receive the sacrifice of a broken heart. Jesus, what can I give? What can I bring to so faithful a friend, to so loving a king, Savior? Uh, before we pray together, let me read the rest of that psalm that Gary uh, begun with just now, Psalm 27. <clears throat> Hear, O Lord, when I cry aloud. Be gracious to me and answer me. You have said, seek my face. My heart says to you, your face, Lord, do I seek. Hide not your face from me. Turn not your servant away in anger. O you who have been my help, cast me not off, forsake me not, O God of my salvation. For my father and my mother have forsaken me, but the Lord will take me in. Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me on a level path because of my enemies. Give me not up to the will of my adversaries, for false witnesses have risen against me, and they breathe out violence. I believe that I shall look upon the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. Let's pray together. Creator God, author of all existence, source of all blessing, we adore you. For you have made us able to know you. You have led us to desire you. And we confess together this morning that though we desire you, we have so often elevated our own worldly desires, pursued them first, loved them first. And we praise you this morning for revealing yourself to us in the gospel, for your gift of peace to us for your patience and your grace to us, for the depths of your mercy for us. Lord, we praise you. And so would we be those who not only hear you, but who know you, who walk with and rejoice in you, who walk by the light of your word. Keep us always longing for your salvation. 
by your Holy Spirit this morning, give us comfort and blessings and grace and rejoicing. We want to pray so much this morning, Lord, for those of our brothers and sisters who cannot be here with us. For all those who are in care homes, who are unwell. Uh, Lord, we continue to pray for Lynn and for the McLaren family. Lord, that all of these would know both your healing and the comfort of your gospel this morning. As we look beyond our own church here and we praise you in unity with our brothers and sisters across this city, many of whom are uh, join us right now even in worshipping you. And we pray for those across the world, thinking maybe especially still of those in Ukraine and other war-torn countries. Lord, that you would bring peace, that you would make your gospel known, and that you would comfort those who trust and love you. We pray in all the injustice of this world, Lord Jesus, come. And so, Father, be with us by your spirit this morning, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, good morning, everybody. Uh, for anyone who doesn't know, uh, my name is Peter. Uh, I'm the youth pastor here at, at Brunswick, and I want to speak particularly to kids, and I've got something to show you. So, if kids, if you wanted to come up to the front... That would probably be helpful. Let me come up here and I can show you this. Okay. Uh, while they're doing that, yes, let me remind you about the holiday club that we've got planned for the summer, third week in July, the restoration station. Uh, so some people have told me that they are free uh, to help that week. So some people have told me, not enough people have told me yet. Uh, so please do consider that. Um, I'll be here all day, I'll be at the lunch, uh, so yeah, if you've been thinking about that but haven't let me know yet, it'd be great if you could let me know today, uh, that would be fantastic, because uh, it's not long before we'll need to start uh, getting the publicity and all that sort of stuff together, so yeah, we need to know that we've got a, a team together. Uh, the other thing is to say, Kids Church, um, in Jul June and July, we're quite short of leaders in June and July, so if you were able to help with that... Just for those two months, it wouldn't, you know, you, you wouldn't be signing up forever. But if you would be able to help with those two months, that would be fantastic. And what it would be, it would be, uh, you could help just as a helper. So there would be somebody else who would be experienced and would lead the, the, the kids' church. But if you were there as a helper, that would be fantastic. So yeah, have a think about that. And you can let me know if you would be free June and July for that. Okay. Right, kids, are you ready? Okay. Who would like to come up and have a look at this? bottle and rope okay and come and examine it okay why don't you two come up uh, i want you to have a look check the bottle check that the rope okay check that there's nothing suspicious this is about suspicious? it there's See? tons of dirt and stuff on it no i think that's okay don't worry about that i don't think that's going to affect it there's a crack right here there's a crack now that's just where it's molded okay you're very suspicious, you guys. But anyway, what I want you to see, what I want you to see, is you, if you can do, is do you think that this bottle can hang on this rope? Yes. So, yes. Yeah, so if you let go of the bottle, it'll stick on the rope. No. Do you think that's possible? Yeah. Okay, let me just turn around, everyone can see what you're doing. Okay, do you think you can get it to stick? Yeah. No. Okay. Okay. But what if I told you, that by putting this rope in like this, right? So you put it in like this, put it in like this, and then do that, right? And then you go, abracadabra, oh look, it's balancing on the rope, it's hanging on the rope, see? Because you're holding it. No, I'm not. <laughs> I'm not holding it. Oh, I think I understand this now. You think you understand it now? Okay, do you think I've got magic powers? No. No. Do you think there's a magnet somewhere in that? Okay, do you, think it's some, do you think it's some kind of trick? Yes. yes, of course. It's just a trick, isn't it? It's just a trick, okay? Just put it in like that. Just pull it a little bit. 
And then look, it's magic. It's magic. It's magic. It's magic. Right, see if you can do it. Now that I've shown you how to do it. Put it in, move it upside down. And then gently pull it out, and then... Oh, it's not working. It's not working. Okay. So maybe I do have magic powers. No. no. It's just a trick, isn't it? Okay, do you want to know the secret? Do you want to know the secret? Okay, my son is desperate to know the secret. I showed him this trick yesterday, and I didn't tell him the secret. Look, here's the secret. There's a little rubber ball... There's a little rubber ball. You just drop it in there. Yes, I put it in there without you looking, and then it makes the rope stick. You pull it, so I it's so it, so it, oh, it's not working now. <laughs> I've spoiled the magic. I've spoiled the magic. That's funny. Right. Oh, it's a bit stuck. Right, yes. So you get the ball in the right place until it catches and it sticks on the ball. There we go. Or you could just tie it around. So that's just a big yeah. magic. Okay, so you have a sit down. Now, why am I doing some silly magic for you guys? Why am I doing you some silly magic? And in fact, that's, do you know what? That is a magic trick that I had when I was your age, okay? That's what I had, okay? And I enjoyed doing these little tricks. But we're learning and we're thinking about that today because last week up in kids' church, all the primary school kids, kids' church, were learning about Paul and about how Paul had gone to Ephesus. And in Ephesus, you know, they, 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 they liked sort of knowing all sorts of magic and tricks and things. But Paul, Paul was given amazing power, okay? Not magic tricks. He wasn't doing magic tricks, but he was able to do miracles because God wanted people to see that Paul was working for him, okay? And, and it meant that even handkerchiefs, even handkerchiefs that Paul had, people could take them and... If they put them on somebody who was ill, that person would get healed. It was God's amazing, mir miraculous power shown through Paul. But it was just so that people would see that Paul could be trusted. And Paul was really telling people the right stuff. People were, Paul was really saying what God wanted him to say and doing what God wanted him to say. And what was he doing? What was the thing that Paul was telling them about? What was Paul telling the people about? Who knows? Exactly. He was told, he, Paul was telling them about Jesus. He was telling them about the amazing power of Jesus that means that we can be forgiven and we can be part of God's family. Okay? And God can bring us. God can change us. He can bring us to that point where we repent. We turn away from our own ways and we go God's ways and we can be forgiven. And some people in Ephesus, they thought they could, they didn't believe in Jesus. They weren't trusting in Jesus, but they thought they could use Jesus his name like a magic word. They thought they could use Jesus' name as a magic word, and they tried to do that, but it didn't work out for them, did it? Does anybody know what happened to them? What happened to the guys that thought, oh, yes, we'll use Jesus' name like a magic word? He said he's on Jehovah. What happened to them? So, they, saw? Yeah. so they, they said demons go out of the man in the name of Jesus Christ, but because they they didn't... The, because. Because they were just doing it for money and stuff, then God didn't let them do it. And the demon, the man that was being possessed by a demon, to beat them up. Okay, yeah, they got beat up. Okay, it did not end up well for them at all. Okay, they thought they could just use it, but they got beat up. Okay, Jesus, the name of Jesus, it's an amazing name, but it's not a magic word. Okay, it's not, we can't just say these things. We need to put our trust in Jesus. We need to follow Jesus and believe in him. And then... We can be part of God's family. We can be forgiven and we can know God the Father. Okay, so you are guys are going to be continuing. So after Paul was in Ephesus, he decided he was going to go to Jerusalem. And you're going to be find out, finding out about that next. Do we have the, uh, the groups just now? Okay, so you're going to be upstairs, primary school kids, uh, kids church. You'll be upstairs with Sheba and myself uh, learning more about Paul. And he decided to go to Jerusalem. And you'll find out what happened to him in Jerusalem. Okay? Uh, so, yeah, during the next song, we'll go out. So all the youngest ones will head out this door to room three, to the creche with uh, John McCauley and Alex. Uh, room two, so the sort of preschoolers, 
will be out this way, room two for, with Corey and Naomi Boyd, primary school, like I said, upstairs with Sheba and myself, and then the embassy, so that's all the secondary age kids, um, S1 to S6, uh, you guys are heading out to room one, and you'll be with Stuart Thompson and Danny. Okay, for a Bible study, you'll be looking at the same uh, passage um, as uh, Graham will be preaching on. So let me just pray for all the kids and for the kids' church leaders as well. Okay, you ready? P-R-A-Y. Dear God, we thank you for today, and we thank you especially for all the boys and girls who are here. Lord, we love having them here. We love the, the joy and the life that they bring uh, to our church family. So yeah, we thank you for each precious life. And Lord, we pray that you would help them as they go to their various groups, help them to listen well. And Lord, we thank you for all the, the kids church leaders, all the different helpers that are giving up their time to look after and teach the kids. Lord, I pray that you would uh, speak through them, help them to teach the kids well. And Lord, we th uh, pray for uh, the holiday club as well coming up. And Lord, pray that it would be your will that this would be able to go ahead, that we would have a good team. And Lord, we would be able to use it to tell boys and girls about the amazing love of Jesus. We pray this in his name. Amen. Okay. And we're going to stand and sing again. You alone can rescue.
John chapter 8, verse 12 to 30. When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. The Pharisees challenged him. Here you are, appearing as your own witness. Your testimony is not valid. Jesus answered, Even if I testify on my own behalf, my testimony is valid, for I know where I came from and where I am going. But you have no idea where I come from or where I am going. You judge by human standards. I pass judgment on to you, on to no one. But if I do judge, my decisions are true, because I am not alone. I stand with the Father who sent me. In your own law, it is written that the testimony of two witnesses, witnesses is true. I am one who testifies for myself. My other witness is the Father who sent me. Then they asked him, Where is your father? You do not know me or my father, Jesus replied. If you knew me, you would know my father also. He spoke these words while teaching in the temple courts near the place where the offerings were put. Yet no one seized him because his hour had not yet come. Once more, Jesus said to them, I am going away and you will look for me and you will die in your sin. Where I go, you cannot come. This made the Jews ask, will he kill himself? Is that why he says, where I go, you cannot come? But he continued, you are from below, I am from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. I told you that you would die in your sins if you do not believe that I am he. You will indeed die in your, die in your sins. Who are you, they asked. Just what I have been telling you from the beginning, Jesus replied, I have much to say in judgment of you, but he you se who sent me is trustworthy. And what I have heard from him, I tell the world. They did not understand that he was telling them about his father. So Jesus said, when you have lifted up the son of man, then you will know that I am he, and that I do nothing on my own, but speak just what the Father has taught me. The one who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I also do what pleases him, even as he spoke. Many believed. Okay, morning everyone. <clears throat> um, it's lovely to see you here today. Lovely to meet some new faces as well. You are so welcome here today. My name is Graham uh, and I'm the, the pastor of the church here. Um, so what I'd love you to do is to open your Bible and come back to John chapter 8. And this is where we're going to be in these verses today. Um, wonderful verses that have so much to teach us this morning. Uh, and I've just been so thrilled and challenged to get into this today. But um, let's pray, will we, before we begin, and then we'll get in. Father, I think of the words of Romans chapter 12, and what Paul would write, the plea to his readers to be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Do not be conformed to the pattern of this world. So, Father, we're so aware of the many things that we bring in here today. The worries, the concerns, the doubts, the questions, the grievances, the heartaches. Father, we pray that you would help fix our eyes on the one who's right at the center of this passage, who holds out the offer of eternal life to us this morning. Father, we pray in your spirit's power and in the wonderful name of your son. Amen. Amen. Uh, so, with John chapter 8 open in front of you, whoever you are here today, here is the central admission that this passage, as Jesus speaks, he invites us all to embrace today. And it's an admission that according to research done by British car insurance company Sheila's Wheels, remember them? Bonds are car insurance deals. According to them, the male of the species is less likely to make than the female. And it's an admission that our refusal to admit means that the average driver in the UK 
drives and get this, 276 miles, more than they need to every single year. You with me? What's the admission? I don't know where I'm going, okay? Asking for directions. Can we flick it on, guys? I don't know where I'm going. Now, here's the question. When was the last time you put up your hands and admitted that? Yeah? You're lost. I don't know where I'm going. It's not a phrase, is it, that comes naturally to any of us. Because I think we live in a world where we're taught that we should know where we're going. Yeah? We love to think that we know where we're going. And the cultural air that we breathe in and out every day trains us to think that today, with all the opportunities that our generation enjoys, that we've got this. Okay, it's the first song you hear when you go into Disneyland. That lovely lullaby from Cinderella. No matter how your heart is grieving, if you keep on believing, the dream that you wish will come true. And that sounds very nice, doesn't it? It's lovely. But I don't think it's true for the vast majority of people who live in this world, right? We drove in there past Sainsbury's, uh, just at the Grange, and there's the lady sitting begging for money. I don't think that's coming true for her. And yet I wonder if you're convinced this morning if it's true for you. Let me give you two figures that I learned of this week that maybe will help us think on whether the things that the world tells us where life is to be found are actually where life is to be found. Here's the first one. Here's the number. Uh, 400. Any idea what that is? You won't? Let me tell you. That's the number of hours worth of video content that are uploaded to YouTube every single minute of every single day. Loving that? 400 hours worth of content. Podcasts, music, opinions, debates. We are a generation who is rich on information. In fact, I read a statistic this week that in the year 2018, 90% of the information we had as a species was ours only in the last two years. You got that? So 2016 to 2018, 90% of the information that we have as a species came in those two years. We are a generation that is rich on information. And yet here's the other figure for you. It's 9.4. So according to my friend that works with young people up and down the country as part of the Keswick Ministries team, that's the percentage of children aged between three and 17 in our nation who were clinically diagnosed with anxiety between 2016 and 2019. That's heartbreaking, isn't it, if you think about it, with three little girls? That's heartbreaking. And a bit of the numbers now, since 2019, will be well higher than that. So overwhelmed are an emerging generation with reasons to be nervous about the future and burdened by that crushing pressure to make their life mean something. As M people sing away in the background, what have you done today to make you feel proud? Now, we know that it's not quite a straight line between the first statistic and the second statistic, okay? It's way more complicated than that. But we have to say that those statistics are hugely revealing. And perhaps they suggest that the answers that we think we have in the world today, from both within and without ourselves, aren't quite as freeing as we perhaps think they are. Friends, when was the last time that you said to yourself, I don't know where I'm going? And here's why I want you to know that according to the Bible, to embrace that confession, to embrace that admission is not a sign of failure. On the contrary, that that is actually the beginning of wisdom. Why? Well, because when we begin that journey down the road that says, I don't know where I am going, standing at the other end of that road is an open-armed Jesus Christ whose words offer such deep refreshment and wonderful liberation for our thirsty and our weary human souls. Now, this is the claim here he makes today that isn't a complicated claim, but boy, if we're up for seeing it today, it is a life-giving claim. And here it is, verse 12 of chapter 8, Jesus says, 
I am, taking the divine name of God there, we'll come back to that in a few weeks' time, I am the light of the world. And what will turn that from being a 2D black and white claim into a 3D color one is if we grasp the fact that Jesus doesn't make that claim at a random time and in an unspecified location, right? In other words, put it in modern terms, it's not like if I can say reverently that Jesus is sitting in his living room on Facebook, staring at that screen that says, what's on your mind today? And thinking to himself, "Mm, do you know what? I am the light of the world post send. When and where Jesus makes this statement is hugely significant and it explains why it was so explosive. But before we get there, you might be asking, well, that's very good, but, but what happened to the first 11 verses of chapter eight, right? Some of you might have clocked that. What's happening to the first 11 verses of chapter eight? We kind of jumped over that here. Now, it's worth saying that your Bible might have that section in italics or with an asterisk at the bottom. Now, while there is no reason to doubt that that event between Jesus and the woman caught in adultery happened, and evidence from the early church fathers would strongly suggest that, it seems likely that someone added that event in to some of the early Greek manuscripts. So because it's unlikely to have been in John's original, we're going to skip over it for now. But let me just suggest two reasons why that should be comforting and good news for us today. Here's the first one. It should give us confidence that the words we have in our Bibles are trustworthy, okay? That this isn't fables, we're not dealing in myths here. What we're dealing in is carefully and accurately translated history. And the fact that a discrepancy like that can be flagged only goes to show just how many original and identical copies of John's gospel that we have. So it's good news that the Bible doesn't shy away from that little asterisk in your Bible. It's good news for us. Actually, it's astonishing when you look at the the amount of early manuscripts of the New Testament that we have. Let me just say, if you want to think a little bit more about that, can I highly recommend two things? One is a book by this this lady called Amy Orr Ewing. She's a wonderful apologist who's based down south in Oxford, I think. And she's written a wonderful book called Why Trust the Bible?, Right? One of the best things I've read on this topic. And the QR code, if you want to scan it, will take you to a little conversation, a little interview between her and Andy Bannister, who works for the Solas Public Centre of Christianity up in Dundee. It's just half an hour, you can listen to it on your commute to work. And they just bat that around, what it means for people in our world today that the Bible is trustworthy. She's fantastic on this kind of stuff, Amy or Ewing. That's the first reason But the second reason why that's important to see is that it means that verse, and track with me here, verse 12 of chapter 8 flows directly from verse 52 of chapter 7. Okay, just have a look in the Bibles there. Verse 12 of chapter 8 flows directly on from verse 52 of chapter 7. So when Jesus says, I am the light of the world, he's still speaking during this thing that we thought about last week, this Feast of Tabernacles, okay? One of the great Jewish festivals that took place every year in Jerusalem. And here's why that is significant. Every year as part of this festival, four enormous lights are lit up and they're lit up to commemorate the 40 years that Israel had spent wandering in the wilderness. Now, you can read about that in the book of Exodus if you want to catch up with that. And so when the people light these four huge lights, they were remembering the fact that God had led them in the wilderness to the land that he had promised them. He had led them by light. Okay, more specifically, he'd led them by a pillar of fire at night, And he led them by a lighted cloud during the day. So these four lights are going. And this is the picture. This is the scene. This is the history that's in the minds of God's people as they watch this and celebrate. So these four lights are lit all night, lighting up the sky. Okay, picture the scene. 
This is something like Edinburgh Castle at New Year, right? You just, whatever you are in the city, you cannot miss that light. Some historians describe the scene with these few, four huge lights blazing away, that it was like a spectacular diamond that's glowing in the night sky. So bright was this spectacle. This wasn't just a festival that looked back, though. This was a festival that looked forward. Isaiah had spoken about how God would one day visit his people and he would act to save them and he would lead them by light. This suffering servant who would come to make good on God's promises, to bring them to fulfillment, he would not just be a light to Israel. He would be a light to the nations. And his Messiah, the one through whom he would do that, <clears throat> he would be a light to the world. Now, this is clicking, isn't it, for where we've been in John's gospel thus far. And so it's in this moment, in the most public place in the temple, in the Old Testament charged and filled night air, that Jesus chooses to declare to all who would have ears to hear him, he says, I am the light of the world. You don't know where you're going in life. I am the light of the world. You don't know what tomorrow holds. I am the light of the world. You don't have the answers in life. I am the light of the world. You're nervous about the future. I am the light of the world. Follow me. Follow me. That's his invitation to all who would listen to him. I am the light of the world. And maybe just to help us feel the pointy contours of Jesus' claim, all I want to do is just help us as a community this morning ask two questions of ourselves as we think about his claim. You up for this? Okay, I'll take that silence as yes. Here's the first one. Okay, ask ourselves, are we in denial about our darkness? You see, Jesus lovingly says, would you see that without me, you are lost in darkness? And he says to the Pharisees, and you will die in your sin. And presumably that is a reference to those who wandered in the wilderness and who perished for their lack of belief in where God was taking them. You're in the darkness. And if you think about it, it's kind of what makes light light, isn't it? Okay, I've, I've never met a fireworks company whose business model is to put on displays during the day. Wouldn't last very long, would they? You see, the Pharisees in this context, they know exactly what Jesus is saying. They are offended by what he's implying, not just because of what he's saying about him, but because of what he is implying about them. And I have to say, this is one of the things that I love most about Jesus. And there's a lot of things. But this is one of the things I love most. Do you spend enough time with him? And you'll soon come to see that so unlike our politicians who pick their words based on whether they're going to attract voters or not, that one of the most refreshing things about Jesus of Nazareth is that he's never interested in winning popularity contests. There's something deeply endearing about his heart here. And that means that we can trust his words. It means that we should be deeply sobered by what picture he's painting here of the human condition. Maybe three quick pit stops here for you up for taking notes. Here's the first one. His origin should humble us. You see, Jesus says, verse 23, to the Pharisees, you are of this world. You see, I, I am not of this world. He's contrasting the two origins. He is from above. They, on the other hand, are of the flesh. You think in worldly terms and judge things by worldly standards. Jesus says, when you hear me speaking, you're hearing the very voice of your creator. And that should deeply humble us, I think, when we recognize his origin and maybe secondly, his cross should convince us, verse 28. Jesus says to the Pharisees, when you've lifted up the Son of Man, do you see it? And by lifting up there, he's talking about his death. 
there's going to be something verifying about that event. For it proves that what he's saying is true about the darkness of our hearts and of our world that he's come to save us from. And he's saying that the cross is a place where we see that our sin is a much bigger problem in our lives than we think it is. It's a much bigger problem than we think it is. It's often what happens when you put your car in for an MOT, isn't it? You get that dreaded phone call from the garage. It's never a good sign when often happens with me that the voice on the other end starts with the word right. Which is code for, isn't it? There's a lot more wrong under the bonnet than I think you thought there was. And life teaches you that, doesn't it? As you go on in life, they actually you realize sin in my heart is a much bigger deal. It's tentacles in much further places than I ever thought was true. And here's what I love. I told you about that section in the bit before, about how we're skipping over it. Well, let me just skip into it just for a few seconds. Let me just show you something I had never seen before until this week. Come with me, okay? Verse 9. So when the Pharisees throw this adulterous woman into the middle of the circle and they say, Jesus, what are you going to do? Right? She deserves to die. She's got it wrong. She's messed it up. Jesus replies, verse 7, do you see this reply? Let he who is without sin cast the first stone. Oh, that is brilliant. Again, it's so, the thing that so often convinces me that he is from above, that his wisdom is unparalleled. Again, as we see politicians floundering when doing TV and radio interviews, tongue-tied, their PR teams in the background doing all sorts of charades, trying to get them to stop talking. When Jesus is up against questions that put him in between a rock and a hard place, his answers are stunningly good. He is superbly unpredictable. And isn't it interesting, here's where we kick in with verse 9, isn't it interesting that as one by one they begin to drift away having felt the challenge of Jesus' call, who is it that leads the way? Look at it. Who is it that leads the way? Verse 9 there. It's the older ones. Here is the strange thing about the Christian life. That as we grow and follow Jesus more, we become not less aware of our sin. We become more of the sin, more aware of the sin of the depth of it that resides in our human hearts. Is that not true? You're not more aware of the, of the things, the ways that you get stuff wrong as you think about who Jesus is and yet at the same time running like a speed train on the parallel track to the sin train is your awareness of the depths of the mercy and the love of Jesus Christ. And some of us will have grown up on that old, with the words of that old hymn. Oh, the deep, deep love of Jesus. Vast, unmeasured, boundless, free, rolling as a mighty ocean in its fullness over me. The gospel says that the Christian life is one where you realize you need Jesus more as you grow, not less. The gospel is not the stabilizers on the bike of the Christian life, right? We had that wonderful experience three weeks ago where our little girl, Grace, she cracked cycling. She cracked it. No need for stabilizers anymore. The world is yours. But it doesn't work like that in the Christian life, thinking that stabilizers is something we will eventually grow out of. No, friends, the grace of Jesus, we never graduate from it. We never graduate from it. And I always remember going to a men's Bible study when I used to live down in Bristol. And there was a man called Marcus there. Marcus holding down a full-time job. Marcus, three kids at home. Marcus trying to do his best. And there I was as an impressionable 25-year-old who thought he had the world sussed. 
And the conversation comes round to what is some of the insights that you're learning about parenting right now? And I'm fully expecting Marcus to say something like, here's the three top books. Here's the routine that we have on the fridge at home. And do you know what he said? He just said, I've come to see what was a throwaway line. All I want for my kids, the best thing I can give them is not a college education. The best thing that I can do for them is show them that I need Jesus just as much as they do. And it's so true. And I know some of you here, you're in that place and you're struggling with the fact that you cannot serve here as much as you can because home life is full on. And I just want you to know, do not underestimate the example that we can set for our children. That's what we want them to see, isn't it? Do not underestimate your volunteering time for kids' church upstairs because we need to model to them. We need to example to them the fact that we need Jesus. We've never graduated from him. We've never diminished in our our desire to seek him. It's the best thing that we can give our children. Is it not true in the Christian life that we are meant to be spiritual Benjamin Buttons? Now think about that for a second. Spiritual Benjamin Buttons. If you've not seen that film, this will mean nothing to you, but go with me. That the older we get, the more like dependent little children we should look. We are more sinful than we dared imagine, but equally, the cross is where we see that we are more loved than we ever dared to think was possible. And in John 3, in the context, looking on Jesus, being lifted up. Oh, yes, loved it. Amen. Being lifted up is the place where we look and we will find life. His cross should convince us, dear friends, about the darkness in our hearts. And his motives should expose us. Do you see what he says? Verse 29. They are those who do things that are pleasing to them. The Pharisees here. But Jesus says, in contrast, I always do the things that are pleasing to the Father. And so as we gaze upon the light of the world, we need to ask ourselves honestly with the Spirit's help, are we in denial about the darkness? And secondly, and this will be a lot more quick, flip it round. Are we, and as a community today, are we in pursuit of his light? And I take it that as God's word has come at us today, and as the spirit has taken it and done his shining and exposing work in our hearts, that we are going to be challenged. And if you are here today and you do not know this Jesus, that he is just a voice in the world His invitation is for you to come to him today and see that he is the light of the world. Do some of us here need to come to the light? We'll think about this next week, that that is the place where true freedom is to be found. The call is to turn from the darkness that you're in. It's what the word repentance means. It's right at the heart of that word. It means to turn, turn from the darkness, turn to the light, turn from your sin, acknowledge Jesus' righteousness turn from the darkness you're in and run to his gracious light. And I guess for others here today, the question is, are we walking in the light? As we bring ourselves to his words, I love it. The psalmist talks about Psalm 119, God's word being a light to our path, talking about his word being a lamp to our feet. And the way that we pursue Jesus is to submit ourselves to his lordship as we allow him to lead us through his word. Now, some of us I know here today, as we think about the application of this, are making some really big decisions about our futures, right? Students, you're coming to the end of your degrees. Others of us are coming to the end of our working life, thinking about retirement. All sorts of other things, big decisions that we're making in our lives Let me ask is, are we making these decisions, bringing them to the light of 
the world. There was a wonderful lady in America called Jen Wilkin, and I should have put her quote up, but I forgot to put it up. Just finished a wonderful book of hers recently, and here's what she says about decision-making. She says, what if the primary question we asked ourselves wasn't, what should I do? But above that was the question as we gazed at God's word and gazed at the Lord Jesus, who should I be? Who should I be? As we make, and be honest, there's tons of decisions that we make in our lives. There's tons of different options. But in that decision-making process, who should we be? People of grace, people of patience, people of love, the fruit of the Spirit pouring out of our lives, decisions in life. How often is it the default that we run to our own ability to navigate our way through life? Actually, the call here is to show yourself just dependent on your heavenly Father, that he is the light of the world. He is where the place I need to follow. And friends, our words and actions as well, the way that we treat and we speak of one another, are they driven by the light of the world? You know, when was the last time that because we looked at the light, we saw that we got something deeply wrong? I always love that the word is described, God's word is described as something that pierces the soul. It's a sharp double-edged sword. When was the, question, when was the last time that, that that word pierced our intentions and our motives? You see how this works? Are we deliberate in our pursuit of the light? In the words of Matthew Roberts, who's a pastor down in York, in his wonderful little book called Pride and Idolatry, he says, abandoning sin is not part of the cost, but of the blessing of discipleship. It's almost Jesus rips us out of the darkness that we are in and puts us on the right track and says, follow me. It's the reason that you and I were made to worship and to glorify and to know our maker. Jesus saves us out of it and puts us on track. Do you see what he's saying? Abandoning sin is not part of the cost, but of the blessing of discipleship. And so as we close, and maybe just with the aim of trying to bring us back to that central admission, let me tell you about one of my favorite all-time comeback lines. Ready for this? My friend Carl had this comeback line and I loved it. And he used it all the time. Right? We've got this saying in our culture that so-and-so is a self-made man. You heard that before? So-and-so is a self-made woman. Right? Normally appearing on Dragon's Den or something like that. People who we look at and we think that they've done it all themselves. So my friend Carl, when he, uh, when he used to hear somebody use this line, of themselves, of someone else, he used to reply and he used to say, huh, that's interesting. Tell me, what part of yourself did you make? Think about it. What part of yourself did you make? I love it. Probably not a conversation starter, probably a, a conversation ender, okay? But it makes the point. Is it not true that 90% of the stuff that happens in our life, to be honest, was well beyond our control? What part of yourself did you make? We love our, our rags to riches story in our world, someone who's lived the American dream. And yet Jesus, the invitation he makes here to us today is to embrace the admission that we don't know where we're going. Jesus says, without me, you are in the darkness. And his gracious call the center of it this morning is a, con is a call to renounce all self-reliance and follow him, the one who said that he is the light of the world. Let's pray, will we? Lord Jesus, we thank you so much today that you are the one who came to as we sang in that song, lead us out of darkness, lead us out of death. Lord, I, I'll be honest, I don't have a clue where this is landing in people's lives today, but I thank you that your spirit is at work in our hearts and in our lives, 
Lord, we long that we would be a community who denounces all self-reliance, stakes it all in pursuing you, the light of the world. Father, help us even in our prayer life as a church to declare in words, express on our tongues our utter reliance on who you are. And Lord, as your spirit takes your word, as he pierces our pride, as he binds our wounds. Lord, thank you that you're the one who knows exactly where we're at. Help us to own that confession. Help us to embrace that admission that where else will we go? For you have the words of eternal life. Father, thank you for your love for us. And we just commit ourselves and the rest of our time together today to you. In Jesus' wonderful name we pray. Amen. Amen. Sing and just use this time. We'll send a couple of songs to close that are going to help us declare our dependence on Jesus. Uh, and then Archie will come back and close our time together. Thank you.
Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your son, Jesus. Lord, we freely admit that we do not know where we're going. And we thank you so much that he is a light, a light to our feet that we might see. And so, Lord, we declare together that we rest on thee this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Do take a seat. Um, let me just draw a couple of things to your attention before, um, uh, before we uh, go upstairs for lunch. Uh, you'll find all of what I'm about to say in our May newsletter, which you can grab a physical copy of out in the foyer, or you can get it by email if you'd prefer. But just a few things um, that, are, that are going on in the next couple of weeks. So first of all, uh, we're having our pizza and prayer night uh, next Sunday evening as we gather together as a church to pray. It'd be great to see you there. That's next Sunday evening. Uh, the following day, that's Monday the 8th of May, a church picnic together, um, just a, a casual time to uh, meet together, to uh, sort of bring your own food and have a bit of a picnic in Sogden Park. If you want to know more about that, come and find me um, at the church lunch afterwards. Uh, that same evening, evening on the 8th of May, we're going to have a, a baptism class. We've got an upcoming baptism service. So if you're thinking about getting baptized or you'd just like to know more about that, and uh, there'll be a Zoom thing on the 8th of May, and speak to Graham if you'd like to know more about that. And then finally, as I've just alluded to, it's our church lunch uh, today. So uh, once we're done, give us kind of five or ten minutes to set up upstairs, and then we'll uh, head upstairs for some lunch. If you're here just visiting, uh, or you're new, you're more than welcome uh, to come to that. We'd love to get to know you a bit, and uh, no better way to do that than to to have some food together. Um, Let me close with this from uh, 1 Peter as he um, declares who we are in Jesus. says this, Once you were not a people... uh, Sorry, bear with no wrong verse. Uh, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvellous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Amen.